Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, non-binaries. How do you do? I am Random Broom, and tonight we are discussing how to purchase a house in the UK. I have been talking to some friends, and they have no idea what they're doing, and I didn't know what I was doing. So uh, this has been a bit of a learning curve for me, but I was like, if it's a learning curve for me, it's going to be a learning curve for a lot of other people. So you are going to have on your team, you're going to have you, your solicitor, your mortgage advisor, and maybe housing surveyor. Okay. So, uh, H serve, we'll call it. Cool. This is going to be your entire team as you go through the house purchasing process. I will tell you when they come in, but this is going to be us. So what we are going to be doing um if i just pick like one of these oh small we'll see how it goes so at the start at the very very start you are going to want to know how much you can cover your range your amount of money that you have to play with okay that is going to um my drawing is going to be terrible but that is going to be 4.5 so if i draw it so at this point, we are going to be right at the start is going to be getting your range. Cool. So getting your range. So getting how much you can get. So how much your, your salary is. So your salary times 4.5 is generally how much you're going to be out of mortgage. So let's write that in. Salary times 4.5 equals more mortgage. So that's cool. That's what we're going to want to know. And then also your more plus your deposit. So I've just thrown a lot of words in there. But what are they? So your salary is just how much you're taking home a year like before tax anything like that just on your contract how much does it say you get paid that times 4.5 generally gives you how much you can mortgage if you have like a decent credit score that's what you're getting okay and then your deposit is pretty much how much have you saved up okay you add them both together that is your range okay once you get that you can then talk to a mortgage advisor, okay, about different types of mortgages and stuff like that. So let's add this in. Let's add, we'll add it like here, because it's still really, really early on, okay? And we'll just draw it. Uh, we'll draw it. Yeah, so getting your range straight after that, you're going to want to talk to a mortgage advisor. So, talk to morg yeah that's fine that's fine cool we're talking to the mortgage advisor um when you talk to the mortgage advisor they're going to tell you a whole bunch of interesting things that to be honest you won't really care about too much what you really want to get from these is how much like so is this basically how much you can actually get because this is just a ballpark figure. They're going to tell you how much you can actually afford. Okay. Like your credit score might be different. So that 4.5 might be four or three and a half. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, they're also going to tell you. So in fact, I can just put this down here. So yeah, your, so they'll tell you the actual mortgage you can get and they will also tell you um the price per month for that okay or your ppm let's just let's just call it that because it's easier so price per month so how much you are paying per month for that mortgage basically you don't want to screw yourself over by getting a mortgage that you can afford on paper in practice you definitely can't okay um the mortgage advisor will also take in any debt you have 
Okay, so the idea is when you go to the mortgage advisor, you want as little or zero debt. Okay, the less debt you get, the more they're going to get closer to that 4.5. And that 4.5 is the very top of the range. Okay, but you talk to your mortgage advisor, you get everything set out, you can get your, they might even at this point be able to get you like an agreement in principle. So, uh, uh, an AIP. Okay, your agreement in principle is you basically going, I would like to take this. Okay, this could also be done in other places. But you basically saying, I like this mortgage, I'm going to take this mortgage, and the bank agrees to it in principle once they like view the house and stuff like that. But for now, they just agree to it. Okay, we get all of that set up. We now know how much potentially we can spend on our house. Okay, at this point, this is when you start looking. Okay, so we get to this, we get our actual amounts from here. And then we start looking. So let's put this, I don't know, here, let's say. This is not an exact science on my side. Okay. So we're going to say, oh God. Uh, start looking for house. And this can be a, um, this can be a flat. This can, like all of mine have been flats, really. Um, yeah, so start looking for a house. This is when you download your right move, download your Zillow, download your uh, on the market or God, what was the other one? Zoopla. Yeah, download those. Start having a look in the area that you actually want to be in. You'll notice that they are very, very expensive. Okay, very, very expensive. Um, regardless of where you are, no one's ever looked at these places and gone, or oh, it's a lot cheaper than I thought. No one ever. No one. Never existed. So, once you've done that, you will start looking for a house. When you start looking, I suggest you look at as many as you can. You want as much, as much information about what is on the market at any one point. When you are looking for a house, you'll see different, you'll see different, um, oh god, what are they called? Yeah, right. You'll see different postings. Okay. You'll see different postings where it's in the region of X amount or exceeding X amount or whatever it says. Okay. Don't believe any of it. Okay. That is the seller. That's the seller saying, I will not accept anything less than this. But they only say that when it's going well. Okay. If that's been up, if that house has been up for like six months, which you can look at if you go onto Chrome, if you go on Chrome, you can download a whole bunch of extensions about historic house prices and stuff like that. When postings get listed, their listing price at the beginning, and then any changes in that price, okay, they will always say, oh, I want this much. And you can generally hit them with a lower offer. Okay, I wouldn't suggest it all the time. But if you know the market you're in and you can look at the house and you see them in a rush to sell or it's been up for a really, really long time, that is your cue to go in slightly lower. OK, when we are looking at the house, we want to know some things. OK, we want to know, is it a freehold or a lease? OK, so these are two. These are two pieces of information that you are really going to need to know. So if it's a freehold, it means you own part of that building. Okay. Whichever building it's in, if it's a standalone house by itself, or if it's a semi-detached, okay, or a terrace house. Okay. Generally all freeholds. Okay. Freehold means you own that building. Okay, it does also mean any works that need to be done on that building will go straight to you. Okay, you can have a share of a freehold where if a building has been split up into flats, okay, most of the, well, sometimes they don't want to go through the rigmarole of creating leases and stuff like that. So they just go, oh, each, if you've got a 
house with a bottom floor, middle floor, top floor, we'll say. It's got three, three flats in it. Okay, they've all got their own entrances or they might have like a stairway or something. Doesn't matter. Okay, there are three, there are three flats there. They're generally going to be a share of a freehold. Okay, and that means that the you will own that property for it's usually 900 and something years it's a really really long time you can get low freeholds and then you all have to come together and you have to talk to the other people and then you need to extend the freehold okay um with a leasehold okay a lease is basically someone has an ownership over that entire building think you're massive like um think you're massive blocks of flats okay there is a building developer somewhere that owns that building okay or there's a company or generally as a company but they own that entire building they are the freeholder of that entire building they will then create leases on the flats they generally go 125 years when they're first built and they gradually go down okay your leasehold on that flat is how long you own that particular flat but if you want to do any works on it you have to go to the freeholder and ask okay not allowed if it's you're not allowed to just sort of do weird stuff to it not to the outside anyway on the inside you've got a little bit more leeway but again check with whoever the freeholder is to see if you can do any works okay um your leases so leases are a big thing when you start looking and freeholds too but leases a lot more if it's a lease because i'm sure a lot of you are going to be looking at leases if it's a lease you want it over a hundred years if possible okay that's your goldilocks zone that's where you want to be that's your cream of the crop okay if the lease goes below 80 years then you start getting something called a wedding tax on it okay this is a freeholder can tax you for a low lease and they can tax you whatever they want okay so generally we don't touch anything below 80 years if it's going down close to 80 years you have to really consider how much it's going to be to re-lease that property up to 125 years again or up to whatever you can get basically because that can be anywhere from like two free grand all the way up to like 20 30 okay so you really have to be careful on that so make sure you know whether it's a freehold whether it's a leasehold okay um if it is a lease they will also i'll oh, draw a little arrow on this as well so if it's a lease you have to be careful of ground rent and service charge uh let's do a little and because i'm fancy okay so if in fact even if it's a freehold you will have a ground rent and a service charge if it's a freehold of an entire building or if it's a freehold that's shared between an entire building you could still have a ground rent and a service charge okay these the service charge is for works that need to be done in communal spaces okay and then any sinking funds and stuff like that they generally go in the service charge sometimes they don't make sure you check okay and then your ground rent is just a flat tax okay be careful with both of these because they vary wildly some ground rent is known as a peppercorn ground rent it means it's basically nothing some of them are like 50 pounds a year or 50 pounds a annum okay because annually it's 50 pounds annually 24 uh, 24 12 months okay your service charge um be careful because again this varies wildly okay this can go anything from i've never seen them below a thousand pounds so we'll say below we'll say 1200 all the way up to like i've seen some in the ranges of like 3.7 grand be careful because these charges are going to go on top of your monthly payment okay or pay per month okay monthly payment pay per month it's all going to be the same on top of your mortgage okay when you're calculating all of this so 
if I uh, I'll put it like down here somewhere. Okay, so our totals, and we will probably end up adding to this. So total monthly will equal your. Let's go right the way from the start. So we'll go your. Oh, I need to extend this quite a lot. This is going to get long. So your mortgage plus service charge. If I can spell. Plus ground rent. Okay, plus tax. Okay, because you're going to have a council tax. In fact, I will be specific. Council tax plus let's have a look so your so far i think we've got about everything but then you've got your council tax you've got your bills okay and then you also have any hidden charges okay this can be like hidden charges for we'll say um gardens okay we'll say cleaning we'll say basically anything that they try and hide from you that is still going to cost you monies okay so this is going to be what your total monthly is do you see the problem it's going to be horrendously expensive okay it's not going to be as expensive as if you're renting but it's going to be horrendously expensive okay um in some ways in some cases that's completely the other way around in some cases renting is better i don't like that there we go okay cool so we so Get your range, talk to your mortgage advisor, start looking for a house, make sure you are calculating all of this the entire time, okay? Okay, because you need to know how far monthly you can stretch yourself, okay? Because there's hidden charges. In fact, we can add something extra. We can go plus food, plus... Uh, transport and then hell even oh, I need to extend it further see this is where the problems come in I'm just going to say plus plus living just in general okay we, we'll say fun plus fun sure cool that is sort of your overarching monthly total that's what a lot of people are going to go on so we have started looking for a house we have now found house okay we'll say we'll say the middle here we go we have now found house so once we have found the house okay i'm gonna put another one okay this this is where the estate agent comes in it's good to know how the estate agents work, okay? So the estate agent so is effectively on the seller's side. Okay, they want to get as much money as possible for this house. Okay, because they get a flat percentage of the house purchase price as their pay, their bonus, whatever. Okay, they're going to help you out as much as possible. They want this sale to go through. They always want the sale to go through. But when push comes to shove, they're helping the seller. Okay, the seller pays the estate agent. You don't have to pay anything. As a buyer, you don't have to pay anything. Okay, the estate agent is there to facilitate the sale. Okay, so your estate agent comes in. They can be helpful. They can't be helpful. Okay, your estate agent will be asking you for <laughs> um, proof of funds. I'm going to call it POF, but proof of funds. They're going to want to see your um, API, your um, agreement in principle for your mortgage. So they're going to want to see some paperwork for the mortgage. They're going to want to see, so they're going to want to see your deposit. So you'll probably end up having to send them a screenshot of the bank the your bank account when you make an offer or once your offer gets accepted okay in fact actually we might be jumping ahead 
let's let's say we're jumping ahead. So your estate agent comes in. Yeah? Your estate agent comes in, you found a house, you are going to make the offer. You found that one house. Make an offer, and it is either accepted or rejected. Okay? So you've made an offer. Okay, they can reject it as many times as they want, and then you can you can offer again, you can offer again, you can offer again. Remember, when you're making this offer, you can always go up, but once it's accepted, you can't go back down, okay? In general, because the seller will think you're scummy and they won't like you, okay? So you make an offer. The seller will then accept or deny this offer. So sell, seller accepts slash deny, deny probably not how you spell it but i don't really care at this point cool um once you've got that so you have found the house you talk to the estate agent about said house it is meeting all of this and you're not gonna end up at zero on your total monthly okay you're not gonna be at zero you're gonna have some extra cash you're gonna have like 500 pounds cash or 300 pounds cash or whatever at the end okay stick in that stick in that like safety net out it's going well, okay? You can cover the ground rent. You can cover the service charge. You know whether it's a freehold or leasehold. Let's say it's a leasehold and it's 120 years. Fantastic. Perfect. Okay. Oh, one other thing. When you are looking at these houses, um, one of the things that you need to be careful of is service uh, shared ownership. Okay, can be good, can be bad. Okay, shared ownership is a tool. It is not wrong. It's just another thing that you have to think about. Shared ownership. So you start looking for a house. You're looking at freeholds. You're looking at leaseholds. You find one that seems very nice, but it seems very, very cheap. Like you're looking at one 200 grand and one comes up at 90 okay all the others 200 this one comes up at 90 you're like what why okay um when you're looking at it you see it says shared ownership okay shared ownership means that you own a certain amount we'll say 40 percent or 45 percent even we'll say 45 and then the freeholder here we go the freeholder of that building owns the other 55 percent Okay, that doesn't mean that they just own it. That means that you pay rent on their 55%. Okay, it's usually quite a good rate, but you are paying rent on that 55%. Okay, so if it's, I don't know, a 200 grand place and you've got 90, you've got 90 grand, you're buying it at 90 grand. And they own the other part, which is 55%. They might end up as a ballpark figure at about three, four hundred pounds a month that you will then have to add to this calculation. It gets expensive quick. Okay. That doesn't take that doesn't take away your service charge. Your service charge is on top of that. It doesn't take away your ground rent. Your ground rent is on top of that. Okay. Um, you can, they they say that you can staircase your way up i'm doing a lot of this i know but they say you can staircase your way up to 100 percent. be careful okay because staircasing your way up means that you are staircasing your way up to that 200 grand you're you're taking sort of 10 15 percent away from them but you can there's usually a maximum amount that you can get per year because and this is a hard truth to learn, they don't want to sell you the other half. They want you to pay ground, they want you to pay rent on it because they make more money that way. Okay? If you just buy it from them for like 20 grand, cool. But their money then stops from that. Ooh. Their money then just stops from that flat. Okay? Sometimes they want that, sometimes they don't. They might even do you a reduced rate if you can get them at like a good time if you can actually get some information from the freeholder which can be a whole nother issue so be aware okay 
but you have taken all that into consideration. We have found the house. Perfect. Okay, we are talking to the estate agent. Make sure that you go and view as many houses as possible and make sure the one that you like, you go view it before you put an offer on. Do not buy a house if you haven't stepped foot in that house, okay? Cannot stress it enough. If you can't step foot in it, okay, you probably shouldn't be buying it, right? I'm just going to say that flat, okay? But you have found the house. It is lovely. When you are checking a house, checking a house, this is a whole other issue. Um, Let's say, yeah, we'll go, I'll walk you through what I do to check a house. I check all doors. Do they open and close? I check all windows. Do they open and close? I check for mold in every corner of that house. I press on the walls in areas where I think there will be mold. Because if someone's selling a house, they will paint over mold. Okay. I check behind cabinets. I check flooring. Um, in kitchens specifically, I check under the sink. Okay because sinks leak water okay and if they leak water and water goes underneath your floorboards and sits that creates mold that creates like damp that you will never be able to get rid of okay or you can but it's horrendously expensive all of this is looking for extra costs that i'm gonna have to pay to fix it at some point okay because you gotta think at some point you might want to sell this house so you want to make it you want to make sure that when you come to sell it, you can get your money back. Cool? Cool. Um, I will Mainly, I will check roofs as well, okay? All in the corners of the rooms. I don't want to see any mold, any black mold. I don't want to see any normal mold. If you can't go up there with a, with a towel and just wipe that off, I'm not buying it, okay? Okay, or if you haven't done that before I've come to view it, I'm not buying it, okay? Uh, I check floorboards, okay? I try and find squeaky floorboards, okay? Usually not a big issue, but then, you know, you've got to go and you've got to fix those squeaky floorboards at some point because they get annoying, okay? This might be my OCD check, like, kicking in, but yes. Um, oh, you will also, in this, there is also, for UK houses... There's your EPC rating. Basically, how good is the place for holding heat and using electric? Okay. There's also like gas and stuff like that. But generally, your EPC rating will tell you how cost effective the building is. That's the way I always view it anyway. Okay. But a higher, your EPC rating goes from A, the best, all the way down to like F or I don't know. I don't even know what the bottom one is. Generally, for what you're buying, if it's a flat or anything like that, you're looking at Ds, Cs, Bs if they're new or they're really, really nice, but it's highly doubted. Okay. It's usually going to be a D or a C. Okay. These are the things that you're going to want to really watch out for. If you buy one that's got a low EPC rating, you can fit better windows okay check the windows make sure they are not single panel glass okay single pane glass make sure they're at least double maybe triple okay any wood around the windows make sure it's not molded make sure it's not wet and like falling apart you'll see it okay the electrics okay look at the fuse box if it's old you're gonna have to replace it at some point okay it's gonna cost you a lot think about it your the water tank the water tank and what type of heating it's got okay how old are they are they going to break anytime soon your water tank is what boils water for your baths for your hot water taps stuff like that if there's an immersion heater fantastic that just makes hot water anyway um yeah and then your heating is it all electric that costs a lot of money when you run it Okay, but generally in flats, they're all electric. It's a it's a demon, you know. Um, if they're gas, how old is that gas boiler? Okay, or if that gas boiler is old, like really old, and looks like it's on its last legs, 
that's a lot of money. That's like a seven, eight grand thing that you've got to replace. All has to go down here at some point. Okay, cool. But yeah, you've checked it all. You've checked it all. Okay, you are a housing connoisseur at this point. You have found house. You are talking to the estate agent who showed you around. Okay, you're like, mm, I can take this. Okay, I can take this. It's going to be cheaper than renting. Awesome. I'm going to buy it. Okay, so you make an offer. The seller accepts or denies. Okay, we get our offer accepted. Okay, so found house. We'll say offer accepted. We'll do it there. It's a bit all over the place, but we're going for it. This is really going weird. Okay. So we're saying offer accepted. Boom. Beautiful. Okay. That is the best news that you're going to hear in a little bit. But this is where your problems start. The estate agent okay they now your offer has been accepted they want to get this sale through quick okay they are going to immediately ask you this is what i was referring to earlier they're going to immediately ask you for your proof of funds okay they're going to immediately ask you for three times wage slips or proof of wage okay they might ask you for they might ask you for like uh bank um statements okay i'll put a question mark bank statements as in they might ask you they might not dependent but anyway as soon as they get your proof of funds your free three times wage i need to move this up Ugh. Yeah, your three times wage slips maybe a bank statement and they are going to ask you for your agreement in principle that you have got from the mortgage advisor. Okay. The mortgage advisor is giving you an agreement in principle. You give that to whoever. Okay. Oh, we have also, um, you found the house, the seller accepts or whatever. You want to talk to your mortgage advisor. advisor again okay you really want to keep in contact with your mortgage advisor once you find a place and you're like i want this i'm putting an offer down i know how much i can afford at this point at this point here i know how much my agreement in principle is and i can start looking at it talk to your mortgage advisor send them the house okay send them the link to the house tell them this is what i'm going for this is how much they have accepted the offer for because at the moment okay all of this stuff inconsequential okay at this point all you've really done is just look at houses and talk to a mortgage advisor which in some cases is free and then in other cases you have to pay but in some cases is free i use a free one and they're awesome i love them um so yeah talk to a mortgage advisor make sure the mortgage advisor knows what's happening so you talk to them the agreement in principle is all sorted the mortgage advisor will also talk to the bank that you want to get your mortgage from and they will send um information about the place that you want to this to that bank and then they'll decide whether they will give you the mortgage or whether they won't give you the mortgage um yes so you have got your offer accepted fantastic you have given the estate agent when they ask for it your proof of funds your free three times wage slips for the last three months um maybe a bank statement or something and your agreement in principle from your mortgage advisor okay um that's all then accepted the house is taken off the market entirely well they're not taken off the market they're um it's called sold subject to contract or it's stc but subject to contract but it stops showing up uh, in the main like right move area okay Okay, at this point as well, we're going to want to talk or we're going to want to find a solicitor. Probably spelt wrong, but it's fine. It's fine. 
who the hell cares no one's going to watch us anyway so at this point you have made an offer the offer is accepted you're going to want to find a solicitor okay solicitors are expensive okay very expensive it would turn out your solicitor although they are on your side won't even start your case for less than like 700 and we'll say 750 pounds okay the total cost for your solicitor at the end will be anywhere from we'll say 2400 right the way up to 3000 4000 so make sure you know okay the estate agent the estate agent that has been showing you around they probably have a solicitor that they like to use and will try and put you on to okay um all fine alternatively you can go get your own i prefer i personally like to go get my own because then you can build like a you can build a rapport with your solicitor okay because they're a lot more they're a lot more excited to talk to you and sort of help you get through this they need they need good word of mouth okay whereas the ones that are just the estate agent passes them off to okay like they're going to get a lot of work anyway okay but let's say this is the part where you're going to need all all things to come together okay your offer is accepted you have your solicitor you have your proof of wa- your proof of funds you have your three times wage slips you have your bank statements you have your agreement in, pe- in principle from your mortgage advisor okay so these two are now a go they are on your side okay you have a housing survey left okay so you have your offer accepted your solicitor will now start okay you have paid them the 700 800 900 pounds to start okay we'll say the solicitor now gets to work so we'll call it the solicitor battle what's going to happen at the solicitor battle section is your solicitor is going to go and look at does this person own the house okay so do they so this is all stuff that your they'll that your solicitor will send you lots of reports about this but it's going to be does this person own the house is it what they say say it is are they who they say they are what is happening in that area like or in the freehold and that your solicitor is basically to stop you getting absolutely murked okay so it's good to have a good rapport with your solicitor okay so solicitor battle commences your solicitor will talk to the seller's solicitor they will go through everything that they need to and they will eventually and it is eventually this is going to take months okay they're going to constantly go forwards and backwards they're going to be asking you for paperwork they're going to be asking you questions on a whole bunch of things where did you get your deposit what happened is it like is it from family is it all from savings is it okay you need answers for that okay so boom we have our solicitor battles commencing make sure you are keeping in contact with your solicitor okay generally your solicitor will be working for you they'll try and work pretty hard the seller's solicitor might take a bit of a back seat okay mine my own personal like experience of this is the seller's solicitors are terrible absolutely terrible they don't want to do jack and the estate agent is trying their best to get this sale through but if the seller doesn't want to ask question answer questions the estate agent's stuck you can't do jack cool cool right eventually at this point as well you are in it for whatever your solicitor startup fee is and that is all the money that is taken away from you right now so you can if you want you can cut your losses here and you have only lost like however much okay this can be although it's rough this can be a point where stuff starts going horrendously wrong the seller might be weird 
okay the sellers could be an absolute nightmare and not want to answer any questions and hold you going for like six months to nine months to a year that's the seller's prerogative do you really want to buy from them eventually you can cut your losses here and start it all again okay if you start it all again you can probably keep a lot of the mortgage advisory stuff you can tell your mortgage advisor that you're pulling out but yeah um but this can be a point to stop okay from here you are basically letting the solicitors do their job okay you're keeping in contact with them okay don't give them a free leash but you're letting them do their job you are there to facilitate answering questions cool um eventually after x amount of time your solicitor will come back to you and go completion completion date okay they will i'm going to move this down a bit they will eventually i in an ideal world because again this could all go wrong here this could all go wrong in the solicitor battle and that's it boom gone okay but your completion date they're going to give you a completion date and that is where basically they give you a piece they give you a a thing a piece of paper uh oh god what is it called what is it called like a legally binding piece of paper a legally binding report a legally binding contract where you have to sign and the seller has to sign okay and it says that i am going to complete this purchase on this date okay it will be a date in the future generally like a month or two okay and they'll go i want i am going to complete the purchase on this date this is where i sign everything over i sign the deeds over to the house i give the keys over that is now no longer legally my house okay they are going to give you a date of which that will happen because you have a completion date and then the end of it is completion complete yeah sure like i said i don't really care but it's probably wrong i don't care my my spelling is always atrocious. so completion date and that is where you are committing to buy and then you get your completion if you sign this piece of paper and then pull out in this space you can be fined you will have to pay a penalty this can be a percentage of the house cost could be huge okay if you get to this point and you go oh i don't really want it you stop here you don't sign everything cuts that's it that you have lost whatever is before this point okay because at the moment so yeah they have been before this point boom gone okay in this space in this whole space here if you really want okay and it is suggested it is suggested but somewhere in here okay you can actually do this right where you find the house you can go from where you find the house to before the completion date you can getting your house housing survey okay i like to put mine here while the solicitor is doing work but you can request to change the completion date if they come at you with the piece of paper and they're like i want to complete in a month you can be like no not until my housing survey is done okay this is where it all starts again so housing survey ooh, ooh, that doesn't seem right survey that'll work sure probably not right but sure okay housing survey they are professional people that will come in and give you a report on everything with the house okay so anything wrong that's where they make their money that's why they're good okay okay so your housing survey you will find a person okay you can google them 
they are seven, eight, nine hundred a grand. You have to talk to them, but they're not going to be less than seven hundred generally. Okay, so your housing survey. So they will, they will set up a date. You will have to set up a date with them, and you have to talk to the estate agent over here. You have to talk to them the entire time. But the housing survey, sometimes the housing surveyor will go to the estate agent and sell this up for them. Okay? You don't have to be there for this. The The housing surveyor can go there without you. But they go in. They check everything. They check the electrics. They check the, like, walls. They check structural damage. They check history. They check everything. And you get a nice big file at the end, a nice big report on everything with that house. Okay? Um... Yeah, that is very, very, um, not requested. It's very, very good to do. It is also entirely optional. Okay, you don't have to do this. You should do this, but you don't have to do this. Okay, if you think you know everything about that property, you are 100%, you have checked every inch of it it is fine you are very happy about it it's still good to get the housing survey done because they will see stuff that you don't because that's their profession but you don't have to okay it's not a legal requirement okay let's actually circle i'm actually going to add something back here as well um ews1 or that's a lot of random characters, isn't it? We'll talk about that one later. That one's scary. Okay, so let's talk about the legal requirements. Okay, so let's go, we'll go down here and we will say, sure, required and optional. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Could you possibly try again? Cool. So let's actually write these. So require yes, required. And then where's the blue? Optional. Oh, it's a different blue. Are you serious? There we go. Cool. So your solicitor your solicitor battle this is required okay so solicitor is required you are required your mortgage advisor is required this is optional okay okay the estate agent sadly is required okay you can't just handshake and be like yay okay your agreement in principle will always be required. Talk to your mortgage advisor. Always required. Okay, and getting your range, hugely required. Cool. And then your completion date and everything like that. Your housing survey, optional. Optional. Beautiful. Cool. Um. Yes, that is generally, yeah, you'll get the completion date you will sign the piece of paper that go i will complete on this day i will buy these keys off you i will buy the deed to the house off you i will own this house legally on this day from then on okay that is your completion date once you get here you go i don't even know because i haven't got that far yet but you go i'm guessing to the estate agents you sign off a piece of paper you go and enter your new house. Fantastic. Okay, things to really worry about. Okay, things when you're looking at houses, things to really worry about. Freehold, leasehold, ground rent. We talked about service charge. Scary. Shared ownership. Scary. EPC. It's scary, but it's not as scary. EWS1. The EWS1 form in the UK is fire cladding form. Okay. If your building has wood on the outside, 
it needs an EWS1 certificate to be like this building if it's on fire won't catch huge fire and burn to the ground it's ah uh, the like the cladding on the outside and inside the walls is fire retardant okay it is legally good okay if your building is i think it's over four stories and doesn't have an ews1 form doesn't have an ews1 certificate you are going to have the biggest nightmare selling it okay you're going to have the big it's not it's not impossible but you are going to have the biggest nightmare selling it you're also going to have the biggest nightmare buying it because you are really going to have to talk to your mortgage advisor because a lot of banks will not lend to these and even if they do you're paying a higher rate i nearly brought one with without an ews1 form my mortgage rate then was 5.2 the one that I'm purchasing now doesn't need one. Okay. And my mortgage rate now is like 4.5 or 4.4. It's, it's so much lower. Okay. Make sure you know. Okay. If they don't have it, grill them as to why. If it's not there, you can drop the price by like an amount. Definitely. Okay. Don't be rude about dropping your price, but you, it has to be like, it has to be equivalent to the actual state of the property but this is generally what it's going to what you're going to be looking at what it's going to cost okay this is how you buy a house in the UK okay as someone that lives there and just the general way okay this is like 90% okay on your side is going to be your mortgage advisor going to be your solicitor it's going to be you going to be a housing surveyor okay talk to your mortgage advisor get them started as soon as possible so you know how much you can actually get this is good for spitballing over here getting your range this is how much you can actually get they get you your agreement in principle you start looking so let's let's do some stuff let's circle the bits okay you get your range you talk to your mortgage advisor. You start looking for a, a house. I want to move that up a little bit. Okay. These are your broad strokes. You found house. You get offer accepted. You start the solicitor battle. You can start a housing survey if you wish. You get a completion date. Do not dick around with a completion date. Okay. If it's, like I said, you can defer it. But as soon as you sign that piece of paper, you're locked in and then completion date they are your big steps okay if all goes well can be as low as three months if it doesn't go well it can be like years or it can be like a year or you know there really is no limit to the amount you can get screwed over okay okay perfect um that is just a broad stroke we could go into mortgages and let me know if you want to. We can do like a short one, but this has been like a, an hour long. So I'm going to cut it there. But thank you very much for being here, if you still are. And uh, we did go over a lot of that, but I can answer questions in the comments or from the best of my knowledge. Again, this is not what I do as a job, but I have been trying to buy houses for quite a while now. Okay. Okay. Right. I will answer questions in the comments and I will chat to you next time. See you later.